Are we on? We're on? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to call to order the Administrative Matters Meeting of the Larimer County Board of Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, August 27, 2019. I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm the Chairman of the Board of Commissioners this year, joined by John Cofalas, Commissioner from District 1, Steve Johnson, Commissioner from District 2, Deirdre O'Neill from the Larimer County Clerk and Recorder's Office is here to keep the minutes of this meeting. Our County Manager, Linda Hoffman, is with us at the controls, and Alicia Jeffers from the Commissioner's Office is here to time the public comment portion of this meeting. It is a tradition of this Board of Commissioners to begin this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'd like to ask you to stand and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're talking about the old days out in the lobby. That's kind of a throwback, huh? It's like being in grade school again, right? There you go. <laughs> Very good. All right, first order of business for the board this morning is public comment. We have a number of folks signed up, and I will, um, I will give anyone who didn't uh, sign up an opportunity to speak at the end. Um, I'll try to seg maybe segregate the comments uh, into subject matter. And so uh, maybe we'll start with the folks who want to talk about oil and gas regulations first. So Jim Vasallo. Jim, welcome. Come on up. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Welcome. Okay. Give us your name and give us your comments, Jim. All right. My name is Jim Vasallo. <clears throat> so I've been um, tracking the oil and gas development for many years now in Colorado. <clears throat> And uh, I just wanted to see this. I'm sure you've seen it before. This is what Weld County looks like. Fracking wells, 25,000 fracking wells. Weld County. <clears throat> Each one of these wells uses millions of gallons of fresh water, which is then, during the process, is polluted and then shot back into the ground in disposal wells. So they're creating these gigantic lakes underground of uh, whatever toxic materials they use in the fracking industry. <clears throat> they never talk about the future. It's only about, well, there's no pollution, no water pollution recorded now. But 30 years from now, where is that water going to be? This is what wor worries me. <clears throat> And this is why they're uh, exempt from the Clean Water Act. All of this while uh, record amounts of our oil, gasoline, and diesel are being exported every day. So it's not just being done for our benefit. We pay more at the pump and we get stuck with the mess. And then we have to, clean, we have to pay to clean it up because They disappear. They go bankrupt and they disappear when they, when times get rough. And the oil industry is always crowing about jobs, jobs, jobs. So I did a little bit of uh, investigating on my own. I came up with this pie chart from the Colorado State Employment Statistics. This tiny little sliver here is oil and gas. Less than one percent of the jobs in Colorado are oil and gas related. In fact, the entire mining industry is less than 1%. Uh, arts and entertainment comes in at 3%, just to give you an idea of what little impact they have on the employment in Colorado. <clears throat> and to prove the point, in 2015, you remember we were paying uh, $4 a gallon for gas at the peak of the fracking boom when um, we were swimming in oil. They were charging us $4 a gallon. <clears throat> 2015, because they ran out of storage space, prices crashed, if you remember, it went from $4 a gallon to about $1.49 a gallon within two weeks. And uh, half the drills in Colorado, because of that, went bankrupt. That's why we have 50,000 abandoned wells in Colorado right now. And part of that is, uh, part of those are what they call orphaned wells, which we have to pay. <coughs> Taxpayers have to pay to plug them, and I think it comes out to about $25 million, <coughs> which we're going to have to pay to clean up because they left. 
they went bankrupt and left. So half the drillers went bankrupt in Colorado in 2015. Jim, you need to wrap up. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the time. Okay, very quick. Hurry up. Uh, what Five seconds. To, what happened to Colorado's uh, economy when half the uh, drillers went bankrupt? Nothing. The economy didn't blink. Okay, thanks, Jim. All right, thank All right. you. Very good. Uh, Eileen Sharon Hansen. I hope I said that right. Hi, how are you? Hi. Good morning. I'm fine. Give us your name, please, Eileen. I'm Eileen Sharon Hansen. I live in North uh, Raymer County, Fort Collins, out of the city. Um, I'm here uh, to speak with you because, number one, I moved here over 30 years ago because mm -hmm. I was so impressed, even as a small child, that Colorado had a reverence for clean air, clean water, nature, a way of life that I felt I fit into. I'm a physical therapist and I work with a lot of ill people, a lot of people that when I see these ozone alerts that are coming over my phone now, at least 75% of the days that I'm seeing in the last few weeks, um, they can't go out. They shouldn't go out because of COPD. And I have a friend who's a physical therapist who um, has asthma that has having some difficulties from time to time that she never had before. So um, I'm here to join you in a call for a suspension, I'm gonna read this, um, of oil and gas drilling permits in Larimer County until the state of Colorado finishes its own regulations through the COGCC and Air Quality Control Commission. There's no way that the Larimer County's Volunteer Oil and Gas Task Force can accomplish in just a few short months what the professionals working on the state are taking a year and a half to study and map. So just last month, the University of Colorado um, Anschutz campus released a study showing 40 to 70% increase in congenital heart defects for babies born to mothers living near oil and gas drilling sites. The study also notes that 6% of Colorado's population lives within one mile of a drilling site. So I'm concerned particularly about a permit of a well site located just a few hundred yards of the Hearth Fire and Richards Lake subdivisions just north of Fort Collins near the Country Club Maple Hill area with close to 400 families. This is less than a half a mile away from where these paths are, um, are cited to go in if they're permitted. Um, we, I would like to know what are you doing to protect the pregnant mothers among them. There are doubtless other similar situations elsewhere, elsewhere in our county, so please suspend all outstanding and future oil and gas permits until the state finalizes their statewide regulations. I will be glad to email you a link if you would like to the Anschutz study and the specific well permits that I'm referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Good time management, by the way. Sure, Shirley White. Hi, Shirley. How are you? Uh, my name is Shirley White, and uh, I'm going to read my comments first, and then might have something to say if I have time at the end. I'm here to ask you to suspend all current and future oil and gas drilling permits and Larimer County until the state COGCC and Air Quality Control Commission finish, finish their work on a statewide regulations. Oil and gas is a boom and bust industry. Drilling a new well may provide a few weeks or months of employment for a few dozen workers, but the effects in terms of air pollution and potential groundwater contamination will be with us from year, for years to come. Last year, the COGCC reported 599 spills of fracking fluids in Colorado. So far this year, the total is already 404 spills. Current permit applications include a permit for a well, MSSU 195, that is less than 100 feet from the shore of Elder Reservoir, just north of Fort Collins. 
Is the county willing to risk the permit application being approved before new statewide rules are in place? If we have other, another flood like we did just five years ago, we will risk contaminating the reservoir with highly toxic fluids. This risk is not worth taking. Please suspend this and all other permits in the Larimer County area until the GOs, COGCC completes its work. I'll be glad to uh, leave this with you. And there's a call. I looked at the permit application and I couldn't see any reference to how close to reservoirs our regulations um, demand that wells be, but this is a photo of where that well would be. And if there's any spill near that well, where's that, where's that going? Um, I have to say I grew up in simpler times. <laughs> I don't know that people now are any happier for all this technology and drilling and wells that we have. Even my shoes are a contaminant that probably cannot be recycled. Um, I think there's not much more important than the air we breathe and the water we drink, except the legacy that we leave our children and grandchildren. And if we contaminate things for them, what have we done? Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Got to slide pretty hard. Oh, you did a good job. <laughs> okay. Kathleen Benedict wants to speak about the Pooter Heritage Alliance. Hi, Kathleen. Good morning. Hi, I'm Kathleen Benedict. I'm the executive director of the Poudre Heritage Alliance. It's a 501c3 that manages the Cashel Poudre River National Heritage Area. Um, I come to you today to give you a little bit of background on the heritage area, as well as to an extend an invitation to the commissioners and the county manager if they'd like to attend our emeritus dinner that we are going to be having at the Greeley Country Club on September 7th. This uh, dinner is honoring a uh, previous Senator Wayne Allard, as well as uh, Dr. Richard Bond, who uh, was a previous president of UNC. Um, in the past, we've honored uh, previous Senator Hank Brown, uh, Howard Alden from CSU posthumously, um, uh, Rick Brady, Richard Brady, the uh, previous Greeley City attorney, and um, Dick Maxfield. This event takes place on September 7th at 6 o'clock, starts with the cocktail hour, and then the dinner is at um, 7 o'clock till 9, and the presentations go on during that time. There'll be a lot of information about the uh, congressionally designated heritage area, um, how it's come about, and um, how uh, the communities that are within the heritage area are uh, utilized and um, experience the efforts of the uh, nonprofit that runs the heritage area. So um, there's a lot of information and it's a good time. Um, we'd love to have you come if you can. Great, great. Good work. Thank you, you folks over there. Yeah, Clarifying yeah Linda, go is ahead. Is this the only kind of invitation we're going to get? <laughs> Is that no, the only we did. You we received or? an email. We got an email invitation. We did. We did. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I was going to take better notes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I can leave you my card. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Eric Sutherland. Goofy, goofy sales tax proposal. <laughs> okay. Uh, guess so. Good morning, Eric. How are you? <clears throat> I'm doing fine. Eric Sutherland, citizen of Fort Collins. The uh, first paragraph of the resolution that you're going to consider today really says it all about how shallow, unthinking, unimaginative, and uh, basically every other pejorative that I've ever used to describe this board of the county commissioner applies to. It basically says that, oh, we need everybody in the county to pony up and pay for growth. Growth is coming our way. We need to subsidize that. We need to subsidize that with a mother who goes to Walgreens to buy some cough syrup for a child. We need to subsidize that with sales tax paid by some senior citizen who's lived here all their lives, buys a medical device, a wheelchair or something else to pay for growth. Of course, what you're not gonna tax 
coming on the heels of uh, three speakers speaking about oil and gas, are motor fuels. You're not going to tax anything in all with any nexus whatsoever with the forecast infrastructure needs that you intend to finance with this tax. You guys, <laughs> no. You know, and at least last time we had a sales tax proposal, we had a long narrative produced to describe, you know, what would the tax be used for if we extend it for the uh, fairgrounds, et cetera. Nothing like that here, no idea. No idea whether or not municipalities will have any direction in terms of steering the revenues towards what they consider to be priorities. Nothing like that in the resolution. All in a county that loses 5% of its property tax revenues to diversions, each and every one of them characterized by some infirmity or deficiency that should legally preclude that diversion, without a doubt, that have done nothing more than subsidize and encourage growth. You guys are so backwards in your fiscal policies at this point in time, it really just becomes an absurdity to look in on. Now, we don't need an additional sales tax at this point in time. I just drove up to Montana to get my dad our $500 worth of car parts, computer supplies, etc. Because Montana has no sales tax. I picked them up at his house and brought them back down with me just to avoid the sales tax burden that we have in the state, which is extraordinary. Bad. And here you are wanting to increase that burden itself over on top of it with no, no background information, no no direction for where you're going with the whole thing. It really is just an absurdity at this point in time to contemplate everybody in the state, everybody in the county, paying a sales tax to subsidize everybody who wants to see this irresponsible, un unrestricted growth rather than putting the burden where it should fall. Very good. Thank you, Eric. Is there anyone else who came in who wanted to make public comment but has not signed up? I, I wasn't sure. Is there anyone here who would like to make public comment but didn't get a chance? Okay, we'll close public comment. And we'll move on to approval of the minutes for the week of August 19th, 2019. Commissioner Cavallis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To approve the minutes for the week of August 19th, 2019. Very good. We have a motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. Aye. That motion is passed 3 0. It didn't sound like it was, but I don't know. Um, who's doing the schedule? Are you doing that? I am. Okay, Alicia is here to do the draft schedule for the week of September 2nd. Hi, Alicia. Hi. So for Monday, September 2nd, the county offices will be closed in observance of the Labor Day holiday. Tuesday, September 3rd at 9 a.m., it'll be administrative matters, this meeting here in the commissioner's conference room. At 1 p.m., you have the Commissioner Retreat in the Rock Lake Conference Room on the third floor. 5.30 p.m., Commissioner Johnson may attend the Parks Advisory Board meeting in the Mountain Lion Room at the Horse Tooth Information Center in Fort Collins. Wednesday, September 4th at 8.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalas will attend the Water Literate Leadership Class at the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado in Fort Collins. At 1.30 p.m., there's an executive session for discussion regarding the Northern Integrated Supply Project. Thursday, September 5th at 7 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the 2019 Loveland Business Appreciation Breakfast at the Embassy Suites in Loveland. 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalis will host a community conversation at the T-Bar Inn in Wellington. His featured guest will be Eric Tracy, the Larimer County Civil Engineer, who will share updates on the Box Elder Stormwater Authority. <laughs> At 1 p.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Upper Front Range Transportation Regional Meeting at the Morgan County Building in Fort Morgan. And then at 6 p.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization Council Meeting at Severance Town Hall. Friday, September 6th at 8.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalis may attend the State Board of Human Services meeting in Denver. Saturday, September 7th at 9 a.m., Commissioner Kafalis will host a community conversation in Fort Collins, and that is at the Dasbog Coffee at the I don't know what the static is. Okay. 
that's all I have for you for the week. Great. Any uh, corrections, additions, or questions about the agenda for Alicia? No. no? All right. Thanks, Alicia. Uh -huh. Consent agenda this morning. Uh, one abatement for the Jacks Loveland Property LLC. Uh, one agreement between uh, Larimer County and the USDA Forest Service, uh, National uh, Arapahoe Roosevelt National uh, Forest, and the Pawnee National Grasslands. Uh, three policies, uh, human rel resources policy about legal compliance, uh, human resources policy about recruitment applications and hiring, and a human resources policy and procedure with regards to compensation. Um, seven resolutions uh, with regards to land use that we've done recently, and five liquor licenses. Uh, would either of my colleagues like to remove anything from the consent agenda? I would not. Commissioner. Mr. Johnson, look for motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of consent agenda for August 27, 2019. Very good. We have a motion. All those in favor, signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Uh, commissioners, guests. Do either of my colleagues have a guest this morning? I do not. Okay. John's looking around to see if he can find a guest. <laughs> no? <laughs> Any friends here, John? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's, a f Everyone's his friend here. I, Just I, me. I I don't, me, buddy. I, I don't have a guest today. Okay, good. All right, Linda Hoffman, our county manager, is going to talk about a referred measure to the ballot for this year with, for the purpose of addressing regional transportation and public facility needs. So, Ma Manager Hoffman, who would you like to come up? Anybody else? Um, no, I think that the four of us can probably cover this. We'll muddle through. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll muddle through. Um, even though this is on the agenda under my name, there are uh, scores of people who have worked on this proposal over the last year and a half. Um, the transportation portion of the proposal began in late 2017, and the commissioners sent letters to all of our municipal partners, business leaders, uh, through the chambers of commerce, members of the public, and other selected individuals with knowledge in the transportation field to begin working on the transportation part of this proposal. Uh, Ken Cooper is in the room. He led the effort once he came on board with us to finish up a comprehensive master plan of the facility needs in the county. And that work began also in 2017. So this proposal has been long in its evolution to come to before you today. Um, the proposal is to uh, is to address existing problems with capacity in our public infrastructure. We hear about that nationally, we hear about it at the state level, but we're actually working with our partners to do something about it here at the local level and this proposal would ask for voter support to make that, uh, to make that successful. So the types of infrastructure that would be funded under this proposal include mostly roadway and transit and I-25, so all kinds of transportation improvements. I think we all are aware of the growing traffic congestion we are already facing. Every poll done of our community rates it as one of the highest <coughs> needs we have in our community, and that will only be exacerbated if the um, state demographer is correct in her projections that Larimer County will continue to grow. So we're expecting, or the state demographer is predicting a 44% increase in total population by 2045, and that will increase the delays we're experiencing in our transportation network by 673% over the amount of delay we experienced in 2015. So clearly something has to be done. Similarly, on our facilities side, the services the county provides are blind to municipal boundaries. So we serve all of the citizens of Larimer County, whether they live in unincorporated areas or in Fort Collins, Loveland, Wellington, Windsor, Berthoud, Estes Park, Timnath or Johnstown, the services we provide in the human and economic health arena, the services we provide in criminal justice for things like uh, judicial district eight courts, alternative sentencing, community corrections, 
are all busting at the seams because of the growth in serious crime in our community. So we need to do a better job of addressing those needs and this proposal would allow us to do that. So the, the resolution before you asks that we would place a question on the general ballot in November of 2019 that would seek voter approval for a half penny sales tax. So that's 50 cents on $100 for 20 years beginning in January of 2020. And the money would be divided such that the first $10, $10 million would go toward funding for the next segment of improvements on I-25. Of the remaining slice of the pie, 65% would go to transportation and 35% would go to grow our facilities to provide capacity for our human services needs and our criminal justice needs. Uh, veteran services is also in that pie. Among the money that would go to transportation, the lion's share of it would go to roadway corridors that would include what are called complete streets. So it wouldn't just be pavement for cars, it would also be bikeways and pedestrian improvements. And then 15% of the total half penny would go to transit improvements. There's a little bit of flexibility between the amount of money spent on transit and the amount of money spent on these roadway corridors because we think over a 20 year lifetime of the tax, it's impossible at this time to predict exactly what will be needed. So that will give a little bit of wiggle room for a future policy committee, similar to the one we have with behavioral health, to make wise decisions for the future of our community. So the three of you have been very actively involved in conversations with our municipal partners. We thank, we thank them for their input. They have been creative and solution oriented in helping us think through what the best improvements would be, what the best structure for governance of the money would be. We're grateful for their input and we will continue to seek that as we would negotiate IGAs to set up that governance structure. So. The three of you have been actively involved in those conversations, not only with your municipal colleagues, but with members of the public as a whole. And um, I am pleased today to bring for your consideration the resolution to place this ballot measure. Very good. Um, any questions for Linda at this time? No Comments from the, my colleagues? Commissioner Johnson? Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to support putting this on the ballot today because I think it's a good value uh, for the residents of Larimer County. When I talk to people, one of their biggest concerns are is what is our community going to look like in the future as we grow in population uh, and as uh, we address new needs in our community. And folks that I talk to are very concerned about traffic, um, they're very concerned about um, the Veterans Services Office being able to provide uh, services in a dignified setting for individuals who risk their lives uh, and families for to defend our country. Um, and this proposal is about it's about people. It's about people that live here. It's about people that are going to be born here. It's about people that are moving here. Um, leadership means looking beyond today and looking to the future and preparing a community that is going to be as good or better than the one that we inherited. And I think the work that so many people have done on this proposal in transportation, in facilities, in transit, with our municipality partners um, makes this a good value for all of us. Uh, last week I went, I drove to Loveland at about 4.45 p.m something I don't normally do during that time. And I went down South Taft Hill Road and at uh, Harmony Road and Taft Hill, the traffic was backed up for a half a mile, almost to the landfill on South Taft Hill Road of people coming north from Loveland into Fort Collins. And we've 
learn from CDOT studies and others that 50% of the people in Fort Collins leave the community to work elsewhere, which is kind of surprising. You know, we work here and we see people working in Fort Collins and we think, oh, we all live here, we all work here. We don't. We drive regionally. And 75% of the people in Loveland leave Loveland to work somewhere else. So the county has a big role to play and a big responsibility in regional transportation. And I was really shocked at I used to work in Loveland for 16 years when I had a vet clinic there, and when I would drive home to Fort Collins, uh, it's been almost 20 years since I practiced, there was never a traffic waiting at that intersection. It's amazing how congestion has changed in our community, and if you go outside of your normal travel patterns, you see that. So um, that is one of the projects that's on the regional project list. I understand Fort Collins is very interested in Taft Hill Road between Harmony and Horsetooth, and where it goes down to two lanes, just there is just causing a, a tremendous amount of congestion and uh, probably a tremendous contribution to the poor air quality. And some of the earlier speakers talked about the legacy that we're we're leaving to our kids, and um, it's 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 not easy to go to the voters and and ask for a tax increase. But if you can make the case that it's a good value, um, that's our responsibility rather than pushing this problem onto a future board or a future generation and say, you know, everybody knows this problem's getting worse, but we're not, we're not going to deal with it. Um, as the manager said, a lot of work has been done with the municipalities. I think on the transportation master plan, we've been working with the municipalities for 18 months. Um, this is a good value for taxpayers because it leverages that money. It, it collaborates with uh, our other partners the municipalities to do regional projects that none of them can afford to do on their own. Um, I think it was uh, the mayor of Wellington was talking to me about regional projects um, in the north part of Fort Collins, He's, and he told me, you know, Wellington just doesn't have the money to do all those by ourselves. Obviously, they don't, but uh, he was very supportive of this because it was regional collaboration and it was communities working together for the good of the whole region. Um, and that's so important and, and so valuable. And I think in the presentation that the manager and I made to the city of Fort Collins, and I know my colleagues have done other presentations to communities, I think the support was definitely growing um, for that, um, that I could see when we made that presentation. So uh, facility needs, um, this board has been very fiscally responsible and has stretched our available funds. Uh, we've built a Loveland office building we built an alternative sentencing uh, unit with cash using our reserves. We responded to two natural disasters without any kind of sales tax increases, unlike some of our um, re uh, neighboring counties had to do. Um, and we're at, we're at the point now where this is a necessary request to make of the voters and for them to decide if it's a, if it's a good value um, for the future of our community. So I'm very appreciative of the work that, that so many folks have have done on this. I think, I think it's probably maybe one of the most important legacies that we leave is our leaving our community in a, in a good shape, able to to have the good quality of life that that all of us came here for in the first place, um, by looking towards the future and meeting the needs of really our future generations. And I think, I think this proposal does that. And I'm going to support putting it on the ballot. And I appreciate all the work that's been done, and I hope folks will take a very good look at it. Um, when I talk to people about it, um, they're very supportive of the transportation measure, and they're very supportive of the transit element of it, and they're very supportive of addressing the needs of uh, our veterans and getting the benefits they deserve. When I talk to people, those are the three things that people are like, they're, they're like, that's all you need to tell me. If you're dealing with those issues that we deal with every day, uh, we're going to support it. So. I'm hoping I'm talking to a representative sample of people in Larimer County because that would bode well for the proposal. Well said. Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, too, will be supporting the motion to uh, approve this resolution, which by our action would refer this matter to the voters. I mean, ultimately, it's up to the voters to decide. I, I trust that between uh, starting tomorrow, I suppose, and election day there'll be lots of opportunities for uh, deliberation discussion and um, uh, t to make the case to, to offer the rationale for why the three commissioners working uh, in conjunction with 
uh, elected officials from municipalities and other jurisdictions why we believe that this is an example of being proactive, of looking ahead into the future, and, and so I it certainly will be supporting this motion. I, I also want to add that um, I'm glad that we're emphasizing the transportation infrastructure needs. Uh, I see this as a uh, important aspect of this for me is that it's, uh, it's, a, it's even though there are issues that folks have raised, it's a social equity issue. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, if, if we don't do anything, if we keep the status quo uh, and we don't look at updating our transportation infrastructure in a comprehensive way, which includes expanding our roadway capacity, which also includes uh, making sure that there are choices for people to get from point A to point B, including uh, commerce to get from point A to point B. It's a social equity issue because if you think about it, uh, if we do nothing, uh, people sitting in traffic to get between Fort Collins and Loveland for over an hour, uh, that means that they're spending less time with their families, they're spending less time with their children. And I think that's something we need to uh, do our best um, to address. On the facility side, as, as Commissioner Johnson has stated, uh, this is about preparing for the future. This is about people and uh, providing good, effective customer service, uh, making sure that uh, we are good stewards of the people's uh, uh, tax dollars uh, as far as providing services to veterans, uh, to families, to children, to older adults, uh, making sure that our economic and workforce development activities are to continue to be top of the line and, and ultimately improving our justice system uh, so that people can uh, get through the judicial system, through the court system in a good way. So for th all of those reasons, I'm very supportive. Uh, I appreciate the deliberation that's gone into this. And um, that's all I have to say, Mr. Chair. Oh, really? I thought you were going to I thought you were going to comment on state statute. You went and got the. I'm no. OK. I'm fine, one, one other thing I wanted to mention that in my brief remarks. I uh, yeah. Here we yeah, go, round two. I appreciate that. I didn't get to cover is the, the piece of this that will complete the improvements on I-25 is really critical for all of northern Colorado. Um, you see a lot of work going on on the interstate right now, and you may be wondering why do we have to put more money into the interstate. The improvements that are being done right now are from Mulberry Highway 14 south to 402 in Loveland, and that leaves an unfunded gap between 402 in Loveland down to Highway 66, the north uh, exit for Longmont, which I believe is about a 12-mile gap, if I remember correctly, um, that, frankly, CDOT doesn't have the money to do. So the, the three lanes will go down to two lanes for 12 miles, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll go back to three lanes in Longmont, and we'll have a, an, a bottleneck there that will uh, be um, like a cement block around the neck of northern Colorado until it's fixed. And the improvements that are being done on I-25 right now wouldn't have happened without the regional collaboration of the municipalities and the counties in northern Colorado. And it's the exact kind of collaboration that's in this proposal with the $10 million of initial funds from this tax to go in working with our municipal partners that will allow us to get that gap um, improved <coughs> years, if not decades, before CDOT would ever have the money. So <coughs> we have demonstrated in the past that this regional collaborative approach that we're using on the transportation projects has been successful in improving the quality of life for northern Colorado residents years, if not decades, before would have otherwise occurred. That's it. Very good. Commissioner Falls. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate a, a second a bite at the apple here. Um, just want to make sure that people also understand that regarding the proposed increase to the county sales and use tax, uh, it would exempt uh, groceries and it would exempt uh, medicine, uh, purchases of medicine and groceries in the grocery store. I think that's important for people to understand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Well, um, 
you guys um, came well prepared, and you said uh, quite a lot, and but but good stuff and important stuff to say. So uh, maybe I'll just take a stab at, at filling in some blanks here. Um, I see myself obviously as the ultimate uh, pragmatist. Uh, uh, my reputation, however, is that I'm a fairly conservative guy. I think I've got that reputation. So, uh, and, uh, and that's fine. I'll take that. But let me just talk for a little bit about this board's record on, on fiscal issues because we've heard some comments about um, uh, maybe uh, about tax policy here at the county. But let's, so let's set the record straight and let's, um, let's talk about the, the true financial record of the Board of County Commissioners for the last decade. Um, this, board, this Board of County Commissioners actually ended two sales taxes early putting uh, ten, over $10 million back into the pockets of the citizens of this county. In 2014, in two, I'm sorry, 2016, 2018, and again, I can't see the future, but I've got a fairly good inkling. In 2020, this board is prepared to give a property tax credit back to taxpayers. Um, in 2016 and 2018, those were $2.5 million that we returned to taxpayers on their property tax bills, $5 million placed, placed back into people's pockets. Um, this Board of County Commissioners, as Commissioner Johnson already uh, alluded to, confronted two of the worst natural disasters in the history of our state, certainly in our county, if not our state, um, without requiring any additional taxes. If you lived in Boulder County, you were still paying a tax to fund your flood recovery efforts there. This Board of County Commissioners, because of our uh, prudent management of the, of the county budget, was able to fund our flood recovery entire, entirely out of general fund reserves. Um, this was in, and this Board of County Commissioners went for six years in a row with flat or declining revenue during the recession without asking people to dig into their pockets to help county government function. We learned to live within our means and we became leaner and a more efficient organization because of it. When I come to before the people of this county and I ask them for a tax, I hope that folks understand that I take that very seriously and that I think that it's very, very important that there are needs that need to be addressed. We did that on mental health and we're doing that again here. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners a couple years ago met with, or probably about a year ago, met with leaders of um, a, lot, a lot of large employers in the county. We sat down and, and had a, and had a conf uh, conversation with those folks about what really was worrying them, what they thought was good, what they thought was a challenge in the future here at Larimer County, continuing to hire people and to grow our local economy. Not one of those folks said taxes are too high. Now, one of those folks told me that there are too many regulations, and regulations are onerous in stopping them from expanding their businesses. Every one of them, to the person, told us that transportation infrastructure is the most pressing need to get their, to be able to get their people to work is the number one need that they have in this county. We already see uh, the cost of housing impacting the way people live and how they work. Um, Commissioner Johnson is correct. 50% of the people in Fort Collins leave Fort Collins for work every single day. That's surprising to me. In my hometown of Loveland, 75% of the people leave every single day to, for work. When you get to Wellington or Bertha, it's over 90%. And those communities in Weld County, those are over 90% as well for people who come into Larimer County for their jobs. And so uh, the idea that, that somehow we should, uh, you'd have to bury your head, have your head buried in the sand for the past five years if you would say that, there, that, nothing, that there's nothing that should be done to address this issue. Um, and it's not simply a factor of, 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 of people moving here. I mean, John and I are part of the problem as well. I have four kids, right? Yes. You're, not as, you're not quite as good at it as me, but I've got four kids. And so um, we, 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 we've met the enemy and it's us in a way. Um, but we need to, but it, it, seriously, if the things that make this a great place to live, the reason that we all live here, the things that have impact, that impact our quality of life so much and make this, we could all live in Denver, frankly. Every single person in this room could live in Denver if they wanted to. There's a reason we don't. And, and part of that is because of the high quality of life that we enjoy here. Um, that's going to require investment by people to make sure that we're able to maintain that, not only for our quality of life, but for our economy as well, and for those great key services that the county provides, things like social services, things like veteran services, things like um, alternatives to incarceration for people who may have committed low-level crimes to be able to keep them out of the jail. This board uh, has, a, has a reputation of being serious in addressing our uh, financial needs in our facilities, not because we want to build 
buildings, but because we want to provide absolutely the very best services that we can, and we want people to be able to the work here to be able to provide those services. That's why it's so important that you look at our record um, with, on facilities. This board, as Commissioner Johnson mentioned, constructed a new Loveland building for almost $20 million, paid for with cash. We built the initial alternative sentencing building for almost $15 million, paid with cash. We expanded our community corrections facility. Um, I don't even know what percentage of beds we added, but a significant we did a ex significant expansion to our community corrections facility, paid for with cash. Um, we're about to improve our fleet shops and a number of the of, of other facilities, um, and we're and we're not requiring new taxes to do that as well. So when the board tells you that this is that these are these are compelling needs that that we have seen the challenges that that failing to address these needs will will um, will provide for the for future people who live in this county and all of us as well because 2045 I mean is not that far away and it and it isn't and it isn't going to be just here and then 2045 it's going to gradually get much worse in fact that's why um, that's why I, I ask you to look at the data on this we looked at six quarters and I'm almost done Commissioner we looked at six six main quarters in in Larimer County and in our region really I-25 U.S. Highway, which is everyone knows I-25 U.S. Highway 287, which is kind of the main street between Loveland and, and uh, Fort Collins and Berthoud. Uh U.S. 34, which uh, I think Commissioner Johnson was talking about, that our major arterial that runs between uh, Loveland and Fort Collins and Estes Park, by the way, which is the number one tourist destination in the state in the state of Colorado. Uh, U.S. Highway uh, State, rather State Highway 402 which is uh, the, that southern connection between uh, that runs east-west for the south part of the county between Loveland and, and actually all the way to Greeley. Uh, State Highway 14, which we all know is the Mulberry Corridor, and then the Taft Shields Corridor between Loveland and Fort Collins. If nothing is done by 2045, the amount of tra time spent waiting in traffic on those six corridors will increase by 673% if nothing is done. So we all know that's a significant problem. We all know what that will mean to our lives and our livelihoods if we don't take action at this time to address it. You would have to, you would have to be disconnected from reality to say that something shouldn't be done now to address that problem. Anyone, anyone could, t if you told any single person on the street about that reality, they would say absolutely do something. This is a great practical, pragmatic solution to a significant problem which will which will lead to uh, a significant negative outcomes if nothing is done let me put it that way and so I'm I'm pleased and happy to support this proposal moving forward so any other comments by my colleagues on the board uh, I think it is Commissioner Johnson's no is it Commissioner Cavallis's turn yes Commissioner go ahead uh, thanks thank you mr. chair well well spoken uh, on both of your parts uh, I move to approve resolution number 0827-2019-R008, describing a proposal for the imposition of a 0.5 tenths percent countywide sales and use tax for the purpose of addressing regional transportation and public facility needs, referring a ballot issue to the 2019 November election ballot for the approval of such proposal and calling an election. Very good. We have a motion. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those uh, in support signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3-0. Uh, the county has referred a uh, countywide sales and use tax for the purposes of addressing regional transportation and public facilities needs. Um, I want to thank everyone who's worked so hard to, to move this thing forward. Um, uh, you know, apparently some people didn't, get, again, didn't get the memo, but uh, the county worked with our municipalities for a year and a half to develop this transportation plan. A year and a half. I'm, I, I'm not, I'm over a year and a half actually now. Um, it, was a, it was a great collaborative discussion. It was a great working group that hashed it out. And when it comes to money and it comes to infrastructure, people are, I mean, it's, it's hard to, not, to, to set aside your, the, your parochial interests, right? But everybody in that room did it. Every single community there did it, and I and I so I commend them, and I commend the the regional nature of the folks here in Larimer County. We saw that tangibly on I-25 expansion, where local government stepped up and brought 55 million dollars. That that's the reason that project is happening. CDOT, I mean, I, we appreciate CDOT, and they did bring a lot of money. I'm not I'm not 
dismissing what they did, that never would have happened. And you go ask them on South I-25 in Colorado Springs. That never would have happened without local governments working together, and not only working together, but putting skin in the game. And so um, I, I commend all of our municipal partners for their work on, on these efforts to really make sure that, that we were um, – uh, that we were able to compile something that I think that is that is that really does the maximum benefit for the people of this county. So, thanks a lot, everybody. Great. We're going to move on. Current fire danger report and recommendations. Captain Loberg and Justin Weitzel are uh, the sheriff's office emergency operations director are here. So, what's going on? We haven't seen you guys yet. We haven't seen you guys yet this year. We're glad. Yeah, we're surprised. We're glad. That's so weird. <laughs> It's kind of weird. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, good morning. Justin Weitzel, the Emergency Operations Director for the Larimer County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we just wanted to come to you since we haven't seen you all here <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, provide you an update. You before the 4th of <laughs> July. I'm not going to lie. Exactly. So <laughs> we just figured we'd take the opportunity to update you on the fire danger, and there has been a few calls uh, because of the concern that is around the county for fire danger. Um, obviously, as things change from green grass to brown and the foothills and the, the mountains people have a concern so we just wanted to come and provide you with the the data that we look at the indices that we look at and let you know where we sit with the current fire danger here in Larimer County and uh, the first page is really just the indices the seven indices that we look at um, the one that you don't see on there is the the weather trend uh, so or six indices that we look at but the 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 weather trend is obviously at the very end of the document, and we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, the live field moistures, which are all in red there, are typically um, dry this time of year. Uh, spring is when they soak up as much moisture as they can, and we haven't had a lot of, a lot of moisture from snow or rain recently, so those are always going to be typically low this time of year. Um, and then the 1,000 hours, they're fluctuating daily a little bit. Um, that's the 3 to 8 inch material on the ground that's dead so uh, as it soaks up moisture from the humidity and the rains and the snow that that will raise but obviously again we haven't had much moisture but they're not all within the criteria for recommending restrictions the energy release component is just the number um, that provides uh, basically the energy per square foot of the flame front based on the fuels the live fuel and the dead fuels so and then the planning levels are the local interagency dispatch center and then uh, the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center that covers Wyoming, South Dakota, Colorado, Kansas. And then the next page is the drought monitor. Obviously, uh, Colorado's better off this year than we have been in previous years with drought conditions. It's just the three corners that are experiencing, you know, uh, abnormally dry, but nothing of significance, especially here in Larimer County. Um, and then just a different look at the drought index there, the Keech Byram drought index is just a different way of looking at it, but again, showing that we're not in drought conditions. The next, the third page is the seven day fire outlook, looking out ahead to see uh, what may be coming up. And so if you look at the, the front range mountains and adjacent plains, there's no significant fire danger predicted by uh, the weather folks from the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center that compile data and always looking at fire danger and it talks a little bit about the weather and fuels potential but it is supposed to get a little drier the next couple days but nothing significant uh, I just got a text right before uh, this and we do, we are in a red flag warning above 9,000 feet which due to low humidities and high winds and we've had red flag warnings the last uh, probably four days uh, but again it's not unusual for this time of year and we've been fortunate throughout the year to have a lot of rain early on and the green grass so um, and then the last one is just the seven day weather outlook and then other agencies and nobody's none of the other agencies we've talked to fire departments or anything are asking for restrictions none of the other counties around us are going into restrictions so nothing significant um, but I know people are starting to get a little concerned with the dry weather hot and dry weather the fuel conditions are changing obviously but nothing that we're seeing that uh, needs to recommend re restrictions from the sheriff's office. Um, we do need to probably do some education on folks to remind them when they're going out camping mm -hmm. um, that the conditions have changed and the green grass has changed and they need to be a little bit more um, aware and 
uh, safe with their fires and make sure they put them out. And so we're going to try and do some joint messaging to get that out for with folks. With the Forest Service. Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, so uh, this is the first time we've we've even had an update from you guys this year. Uh, so I think this is probably the first time Commissioner Kafalis has even received an update. So why don't you talk a little bit about the indices and and uh, and and how. At, at what point do you make the recommendation then that we would implement restrictions or a ban? And, yeah. and maybe talk a little bit about what the different kinds, what the different level of, of uh, regulation we might we might pose would be. Yeah, no problem. So if you look at that first page, there's six indices that we look at, and this this matrix was put together by the U.S. Forest Service, the the counties, not just Larimer County, but Boulder County, uh, Larimer County, Gilpin County, and Clear Creek. And so and a lot of scientists came together to come up with this matrix to look at. So it's very, there's a lot of science behind it, and I can't get all the way down into the science because uh, my job is to put out the fires, not, <laughs> not the science behind it. So, um, But uh, the big things that we look at, obviously, are the energy release comp component, that, that energy that will be released in one square foot, uh, the 1,000-hour fuel moistures, which are the, which are the 3 to 8-inch material on the ground, so logs, branches, logs, things like that. Uh, the Fort Collins preparedness level and the Fort Collins interagency dispatch, the U.S. Forest Service dispatch, their area goes from Clear Creek, Gilpin, Larimer County, Boulder County, all the way over into Kansas, uh, so the Weld County and everything. So they cover a big area, but they look at their planning level, how many f resources they have. So uh, there's not a lot going on around the nation. So resources here in Larimer County, are we have pretty good uh availability of resources that we can call upon if we do have fires the last few years we've seen uh, a drawdown on those resources going and help the northwest um, or the south so Alaska is about the only thing going on in the country and and they're starting to wind down pretty good right now and then the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center is the the Rocky Mountain area we're, we're split into regions and the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center is South Dakota again Wyoming Colorado and uh, they look at their planning level again from the resource standpoint and one is as low as you can get and it is very unusual to see a planning level of one for the Rocky Mountain Coordination Center this time of year because usually the Northwest is starting to burn Wyoming things like that so and then uh, obviously the weather trend we look at the five to seven day outlook and then the seven fourteen day outlook restrictions when we when we start getting into that threshold that's down there at the bottom when we start getting into two to three of those indices, which right now we're only in one, the live fuel moistures, uh, is when we start considering restrictions or recommending restrictions. And then four or more is when we start implementing or recommending implementing them. So um, the difference between a fire restriction and fire bans, obviously, is fire restrictions. Folks are still allowed to have campfires in designated camp areas. So typically, if there's a camp host, there they can still have a fire in the fire ring they can still have fires in a permanent masonry constructed fire ring or uh, they can still use their their grill if they can turn it on so turn it off or on propane um, they can still um, do some of the things outdoors when we get into fire ban that's where everything's restricted and they're no longer any kind of fire they can't smoke outside their vehicle and it has to be cleared of 15 foot of vegetation I believe for when we go into fire ban if they get outside their vehicle and want to smoke so uh, obviously the bans a lot more restrictive and doesn't allow folks to do the things they want to do outdoors but we haven't been in a ban for a while that I can remember so um, any questions on that do you have any questions yeah yeah go ahead John yeah no I th thank you I appreciate the uh, additional explanation of the indices a question I do have is this information is is very useful do we post this online is this available for the public to understand what our rationale is in terms of at this time not implementing any restrictions or, or fire bans so it's not on a Larimer County website anywhere uh, as far as the criteria it is on the US Forest Service interagency website and that is something I could work with uh, if we want to put it on the county website somewhere. I don't know what my colleagues think but I I I'd like you to think about consider that you know I don't know what's involved but making sure that we're providing this information so when we um, we let you know because I've gotten a few communications from Red Feather Lakes area and other places that this is 
you know, this is what we're basing our decision not to do anything differently at this time based on these various indices. So if there's a easy way perhaps to get that uh, posted, I think that would be useful, but I'm not sure what my colleagues think. We could probably put it in the Zapata for the meeting, couldn't we? It's online, the meeting agenda. Yeah. This document. It wasn't because usually what I do is I, I typically put it together the morning of to make, to make sure it's the latest kind of information. More work for you. Oh, I, I, mean, I have it electronically. I can submit no it. No one's going to look at this, so <laughs> I don't want you to have to do any more work. But we can put it. We can scan it and put it as a yeah. part of the meeting materials. They might we? look at it, but they may not understand yeah, it. Yeah, just real quick, Mike, Mike Lobo, Captain with Lambert County Sheriff's Office. We can certainly put some of the information out. I think what we do want to do is uh, encourage some responsible behavior of fire. Obviously, you can see that live fuel moisture has gone up significantly, and I think that's a really visual, visible indicator of fire danger actually coming or, or uh, um, soon to be. Uh, the one thing Justin didn't touch on that maybe you see on the first page is we do break that down into three different geographical locations to get that sampling from. So it's not just one, from one location. So it's, it's, it's countywide and sort of trying to grasp that uh, understanding. We can work with Michelle Bird and, and David Moore, our press information officers, see if there's a, a good way we can put that out that's, that's easy and convenient. Yeah. Uh, but we do want to put that message out that, hey, the, the live fuel moistures are, are dry. So grass is dry, and I think you drive up the canyon now, it's different than it was three weeks ago. So we're seeing a, a change there. Okay, and so you're, you can you can work with them on Facebook stuff or social media stuff. And when are you doing the next Larimer Connection email? It's at the end of the month. It's at the end of the month. So just a few days. So we could put something in that potentially, I suppose. Oh, okay. Well, well, it doesn't. I mean, Facebook. I mean, social media is obviously the 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 best bang for your buck. I think on that stuff. So. Justin, how often do you look at this? Um, I look at it almost every day, at least uh, two or three times a week, just to make sure that it hasn't changed significantly. He wakes up at 3 a.m. and checks it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I do. The I dream last, about it. The last thing I'll add is we did have a couple of starts um, based upon uh, um, um, lightning strikes over the last week. Obviously, Friday we had two, and so they were, they were fires, but they were not significant. I think that really goes to, to validate this indices that we use. Obviously, live, live field moisture, there was a start, and we did have a fire, but it didn't continue on for any significant time or any, any large growth. So I know we're all lightning, so we're, again, it's just been lightning for the last few starts that we've had. So, Justin, if, if uh, things continue as they have been, if we have a couple more really hot weeks, if we don't get any precipitation, um, do you, what do you anticipate? Do you anticipate coming back to the board and asking for some restrictions at that point? Yeah, I, that's the main reason I came is just if we continue down this road of hot, dry weather, we'll probably be coming back and looking at restrictions. Uh, again, this time of year is typical. Um, I know we going into them this time of year with hunting season and everything, but if the conditions don't change and we don't see any significant moisture in the future, then we'll probably need to look at restrictions in yeah. the next Yeah, few and weeks. obviously we'll, we'll try to protect property and life here in Larimer County. Um, one nice thing about doing this in a more coordinated way, though, is if, um, if we impose restrictions in the county and the Forest Service does not impose restrictions, we have to enforce those restrictions in the National Forest where we don't have really resources to do that. So if we can coordinate with the Forest Service, if we both go into restrictions at the same time, then they, they police the National Forest, which is significant. I mean, it's almost 50% of the county. And, and we will do the, the areas outside of that. And so um, it's, it's better to do them if we can have some cons concerted uh, joint efforts with, with those partners, especially from the state. But obviously, we don't we don't let the state we don't wait for the state if we need to impose re some kind of re regulation restriction or ban. We certainly will do so. But it is nice if we can work together and, and do those things at the same time. I think that's it. yeah. And typically, we're always coordinating and talking with the Forest Service to make sure, and then, and also the other counties around to yep. see what they're doing because we we have a lot of folks that live along the borders, and we want to make sure that there isn't. We try and reduce the confusion. All right, very good. Any other questions for these gentlemen? I do not. No? Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks. Keep us up, uh, updated. It's getting ner These guys are nervous now. It's time of year, Justin gets nervous. Okay. County Colorado Liquor Sales r Room License Application for the Old Town Distilling Company. It sounds challenging. It must be because we got the county clerk actually came up to talk about it with us. So... <laughs> yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself, ma'am. Hi, Angela. Hi, gentlemen and Linda. Um, I am Angela Myers, your Larimer County Clerk and Recording Recorder, here with Kaylee from the 
Go ahead. Uh, Kaylee Ogden, Recording Department Specialist. Welcome, Kaylee. It is unusual for me to come up for a liquor license, for sure. The reason I am here instead of Nancy is that she is at a conference. Oh, okay. So we, oh, are, we thought it was a We're covering everything as okay. we need to here. <laughs> um, and it is very unusual for us to get these types of licenses. That, re that This is actually a state license. Um, and as uh, county officials, you are asked to, um, uh, what is it called? You're asked to um, review. Review it, but also give your. Um, well, let me let me just use the right word here. Okay. Object or not object? Thank you, Kaylee. Okay. And so um, you have documentation there from the uh, from the county attorney as well, some emails, and um, we sent this through the normal channels that we do for review, planning, building, those kind of things. Um, there have been a few objections. Um, indicated uh, and those are in your documentation planning is <clears throat> we heard from Carol Evans of the planning department has a concern that you can see well, we don't actually have that I do you have it it's in your packet no I don't have it in my packet here's my copy I can share we're buddies right okay good and right, then so. um, Eric Freed expressed some concern. You are, um, as it notes on the bottom of the front page of the license, um, you will object or not object based on the criteria there. So this is, is this, I don't know if you know um, Madam Clerk or maybe Kaylee, uh, this is different than a than a regular liquor license. This is a tasting room license. A sales room license. A sales room license. Typically, okay. um, we approve and issue, um, but this is a state only license, and so the county. Okay. Because there is manufacturing at this location as well. So is the only difference really between, I mean, if this was a was a. Uh, uh, a tavern or a liquor store is that they they're producing on site and then selling on site exactly okay, okay. Com commissioner go ahead uh, thank you thanks mr. chair and thank you folks for being here uh, a, a question that I have is it appears that the original uh, building permit based on the information that we received that the original uh, building permit was in 2014 and it was primarily uh, related to the manufacture of of the spirits and now of course they want to uh, change the configuration of that building and so on why wasn't there any effort on the part of the business owner uh, to update you know whatever needed to be updated as far as uh, you know complying with the put of fire authority uh, regulations uh, changing the, the the building permit uh, and also you know any land use kinds of issues Do you folks know you know I, I can't speak on their behalf and probably and probably you don't have any any idea about this deal, Lori or Linda. Do either of you have any information about this? I don't have any direct information. I think the thing that is wonderful here is the coordination between our clerk's office and our community development office yeah. because so often there is not a good exchange of information and that is very confusing to a business owner who needs both land use approval, building permit approval, and their state liquor license. And in this case, it appears as though they do not have either the land use approval or the building permit occupancy um, credential that they would need in order to actually make use of this liquor license. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the clerk's office and the community development office for finding this before it appears as though one hand doesn't know what the other is doing in county government because we've had that um, unfortunately a time or two in the past and this is exemplary so thank you for bringing this to the attention of the board yeah commissioner go ahead thanks mr. chair is it correct that regardless of our decision today this is a state um, a sales room license application and regardless of our decision this will be forwarded to the um, to the state uh, liquor licensing and then oh. Maybe just a hair. Is that, I think you're making you're the making your, I think you're 
Not with what you're saying. But what are you saying? I think you might be too close to the mic. I think you might be. Yeah. I think you might be making that fuzz. There. There you go. Don't. You, you <laughs> try again. Don't keep going. That no, you're fine. You're doing okay, but just get a little further away. <coughs> Mr. Chair, it appears yeah. that I may have to start all over again. Yeah, do it. <laughs> right. By all means. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I um, just want to make sure I'm You're clear correct. that this ultimately will go to the state, and they will, if there are some issues with code compliance, those will have to be corrected uh, before uh, the, the, the business owner can go forward with the, uh, the sales room and, and a new business model. Is that correct? Well, they will have to be pursued by, by our folks and let them know of the, of the deficiencies that they have. Yes, okay. but it is a choice. Of, it is a decision that the state makes whether to grant it or not. Uh, I'm sure, certain that they take into consideration your objection or non-objection, but ultimately the decision is theirs. Well, it, so is there? Are there comments from the fire department? I can't find them in here. I can't find them. Oh, we didn't. The did we contact them? We did not. Okay. We did contact the fire department, and they didn't but we submit. have no comments from. Okay. Them. Okay. Um, I'm surprised that the health department has no objections with the application because typically um, it moves you to a different standard when you're actually, you know, serving any. I mean, I've we had some businesses in Loveland that were that I kind of wrangled with the health department and tried to help help uh, kind of find some common ground between manufacturing facilities, which this is what it sounds like, a, you know, a food or or beverage manufacturing facility. And then someone who actually is serving that's almost like a, a restaurant or a, or a bar room or something like that and so I'm, I'm really surprised that they don't have um, have issues with the application so it it makes me believe that I, since I haven't hadn't seen this uh, um, submittal prior to this that they must have done some of the necessary work as far as um, I suppose having like wash sinks and separate hand washing sinks and um, I, I imagine you'd have to have a, a drop ceiling over the places where you're going to serve the um, alcohol, and there, there's a lot of things that usually those folks require. So I'm assuming that must be done. I, I don't. I guess I don't know, but it kind of. But but then to hear the the building department uh, bring up some probably legitimate concerns, I I'm a little torn. I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know what uh, what the the correct path forward is um, would would we typically require someone like this to go through some kind of land use approval process prior to prior to gaining a liquor license yes okay and so we have a fairly recent example of someone we issued a liquor license to that didn't comply with their uh, requirements of their of their land of their land use do. yeah maybe of their land use um, uh, land use uh, uh, approval and um, and so we've got them serving alcohol in a site that maybe where they haven't maybe addressed some of the things that the county thought they needed to have like you know restrooms and parking and a lot of and some of that stuff so uh, but they were doing that under special a review no special uh, permit. special what's it called special event. special, event special permit. events permits special dispensation from it's Commissioner Johnson theoretically um, so uh, I, I'm a little torn. I, I think probably um, the thing that's the most, the, probably the fair thing to do is that this applicant should do um, what what any other applicant would have to do and and uh, and get, get the uh, go through at least some kind of um, planning review process. I, I don't know that I don't know that there would be a lot of um, issues. I wouldn't. I'd hope that it would be quick and simple and easy for them to. To navigate, but I, I'm kind of concerned that they haven't done that. So I'd uh, I'd look for uh, you know some direction from the board of county commissioners. Who would like, I commissioner? Think, hey, Mr. Chairman, I move to object to the Colorado Liquor Sales Room license application submitted by Old Town Distilling Company for the reasons discussed here, including building permits and uh, land use land use review. Very good. And others. Very good. We have a uh, motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Thank you. Madam Clerk, good to see you. Good to see you. You snuck right in. I didn't even see it come in. <sighs> She's all right. quiet. She is. She's, well, not that quiet. quiet. Not that sure. quiet. Well, today she was. Yeah, she I, was. That was. <laughs> I didn't say that. We've been enough parades with her to know that's not true. Okay. County Manager update. What, do you, what have you been up to? 
Well, as you can tell from the big smile on my face, oh. I was on vacation part of last week, so uh, it's great to be back and to see all the good work that happened in my absence, and uh, maybe that means I should take off more often, but <laughs> since I have returned, I've returned to my usual uh, coordination role, so I had the opportunity to meet last week with Frank Lancaster, and as you know, yesterday was his last day as the town uh, administrator in Estes Park. Uh, so we welcome the opportunity to to work with Travis, whose last name I can't pronounce, who will be the new... Mahalik. Mahalik, thank you. Um, but it was great to meet with Frank and, and hear the stories about grandchildren and rafting and other wow. things in his future. Um, I also have begun the process of meeting with departments and offices for their 2020 budget proposals. So again, thank you to all those departments and offices who have prepared such thoughtful proposals and to our budget director, Josh Fudge, and his assistant, um, Matthew Behunen, who are going through those with a fine tooth comb and uh, we have begun the process of reviewing those and putting together a budget proposal for the middle of October. Um, I also had the opportunity to meet with the coroner uh, commi uh, Dr. Jim Wilkerson. They are still enjoying their their new office and morgue, which is another facility that the county built without asking for voter support for taxes. And um, we are beginning work on, or continuing <coughs> work on various other <coughs> building proposals that are underway. So it's been a busy few days since I've been back, and I want to send a shout out to Lorenda Volker, mm -hmm. who uh, was acting in my absence and pre prepared a really nice folder summary of all that had gone on while I was out of town. So thank you to Lorenda. Good. All right, um, Commissioner Activity Reports. Who'd like to go first? Commissioner? Uh, only one thing to share is last week I uh, had the half-day Urban Renewal Authority Board Retreat with the City of Fort Collins, a library rep, school board rep, and the community member. Uh, it was a facilitated retreat. Um, I guess my takeaways were that all the members on the board are fairly aligned, uh, that the tool of tax increment financing should be used very judiciously with definitive public purposes related to the projects. Uh, a lot of discussion of affordable housing. I mentioned it yesterday that I brought up child care as another possible um, use of tax increment financing to encourage child care facilities, but uh, it was very productive retreat and I think kind of demonstrates that we have a very good working relationship with the board as it was reconstituted by the legislation that we worked to pass. Great. Commissioner? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, last Monday, I was privileged to uh, join my two colleagues, the county manager and the facilities uh, director. We presented to the Windsor Town Board uh, regarding the um, half penny proposal. Uh, actually, it wasn't the county manager, it was the director of community planning, infrastructure, and resource services. Wow. Uh, got that right. That's quite a title. You're the only one that knows that. I'm well, I'm getting to. <laughs> Uh, reminders from our interim director. So the three of us were there. Uh, we presented on the proposal. Uh, it was a very constructive discussion, and I, I think we did our best, and I think we did a good job of answering questions. So that was Monday night. On Tuesday, uh, I, I was um, able to attend the Volunteers of America uh, Annual Breakfast Award, uh, Annual Awards Breakfast with yeah. Commissioner Don Lee. And, and I, and we presented an award together. We did that together, yes. Yeah. Together is better. Uh, on Thursday, I had a community conversation up at Red Feather Lakes, one of my monthly community conversations. We actually had uh, the clerk and recorder, Angela Myers, uh, come up to give us an update on some of the upcoming uh, election-related matters. And in particular, of particular interest to the folks in Red Feather Lakes is that we will be installing a 24-7 ballot box, mm. a secure ballot box up by the community library there in Red Feather Lakes. And we also had a, uh, a very good discussion from the um, uh, person from the Fort Collins Conservation District regarding some forest health practices. Uh, 
After that, I headed down the road uh, to Glacier View Meadows and actually met with about 20 or so folks regarding some of their concerns. Uh, an area of concern uh, is related to uh, County Road 74E, the Red Feather Lakes Road, and we'll continue to work on that. But it was, it was a very productive meeting. I was happy to meet those folks. Uh, next time I go, I'd like to do a, a, a tour of uh, the area, but uh, time did not allow. Uh, and finally, mm. finally, on Thursday in the evening, I attended a community meeting at the Hickory Village, which is the mobile home park off of Hickory Street on uh, North College there. It was with uh, people involved with um, a, a group called Me Voss, My Voice, and we discussed various issues related to mobile home parks and some of the challenges uh, faced by people who own their homes by and large, pay the lot rent, and, and sometimes that uh, uh, contributes to some interesting uh, dynamics between mm -hmm. the owners and the property managers mm -hmm. and, the, and the homeowners. So it was um, uh, a good week. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, you guys were busy. Um, I, I was busy last week as well, entertaining my sister from Kansas. My sister Trudy was here, so I spent a lot of time, yeah, with her. It was fun. Um, well, it wasn't that fun, but she's not going to hear this anyway, so what the hell. Uh, uh, but it was good to have her out and good to see her. But um, I will say, uh, you know, nothing will make you feel older. Over the, ne the course of the next five days, my two oldest sons are having birthdays. They're going to be 19 and 16, <coughs> starting tomorrow with my son Joseph, who's going to turn 16 and be become the second licensed driver of my kids. And so uh, my hair was prepared because my hair is about to get much whiter. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, the board is going to uh, enter executive session now uh, for the uh, purposes of discussing, uh, discussing the di district court decision in Thompson Group versus the Board of County Commissioners and Colson Excavating and uh, whether or not the Board of County C Commissioners should participate in an appeal uh, to the Colorado Court of Appeals. Um, we don't have any attorneys here yet. Yes? I just checked, and they're en route. They're en route. Okay. Well, they're not – they're okay. So we'll see them soon. Um, the board is going to enter executive session. The, we fully expect to have a decision uh, at the conclusion of that executive session. I don't, I can't tell you how long that will take. I, I guess I might prepare for uh, about a, yeah, 20 to half, 20 minutes to half an hour would be my guess. So um, the board will enter executive session. We will reconvene in open session at the conclusion of that executive session. So Commissioner Kafalos, look for a motion. You need the thing? Yeah. He's got his own. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I move the Labor County Board of Commissioners enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing district court decision in Thompson Group versus Board of County Commissioners and Colson excavating and appeal to the Colorado Court of Appeals pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024B, which states conferences with an attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Very good. We have a motion. All those uh, in support signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3-0. The board will be in executive session for approximately a half hour.
have fun. <laughs> Unlike the city council, we're fun. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm a, the board is going to come back to order. We've just concluded an executive session uh, for a discussion of the district court decision in Thompson Group versus the Board of County Commissioners in Colson excavating. Uh, the discussion uh, centered around uh, whether the Board of Commissioners would um, would seek to appeal uh, that the decision handed down by the district court to the uh, Colorado Court of Appeals. Uh, did you have anything you'd like to, uh, to give, any kind of introductory remarks before the board uh, deliberates and makes a decision? Did either of you have anything? If you want to say something, sure. Uh, just, to, just to reiterate, um, our advice is uh, to, to uh, appeal. That's our recommendation to the board. Uh, so we would ask you to, to take a vote on that decision. Uh, we think it's important that the Court of Appeals uh, review the legal issues that were decided by the district court judge. Uh, we believe some of those uh, decisions are in error and, and need to be reviewed uh, on appeal. So we would recommend uh, appealing that decision to the Court of Appeals. Very good. Um, comments from the Board of County Commissioners? Would you like to start? Sure. <clears throat> uh, th thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, um, folks from the County Attorney's Office. Um, basically, my decision is to abstain from this uh, this motion to move this issue forward. And I base that primarily on the fact that I was not a member of the Larimer County Board of Co Commissioners at the time when this issue was raised, and, and that is the decision that I'm taking. Okay. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will make a motion. I move the- I want to make some comments. Oh, okay. Well, you could comment after you, the motion. Oh, okay. Go ahead, then. I'd be happy to accept that, then. Uh, I move the decision in the district court case number 2018-CV-030371, Thompson Group versus the Board of County Commissioners and Colson Excavating be appealed to the Colorado Court of Appeals. And I want to make a few comments. Uh, first off, to say this- um, decision to appeal the uh, ruling of uh, our local district court judge has absolutely nothing to do with the land use case before us. As a matter of fact, I voted against the decision in the land use case. Um, this uh, has to do with a uh, whether or not uh, campaign contributions uh, affect, uh, create a um, conflict of interest. Um, I believe the decision is flawed legally. Colorado law is very clear, and the decision uses the words direct, pecuniary, particular, individual conflict of interest. The ruling itself even admitted that none of those direct conflict of interest, which the law is very clear about, a member would uh, recuse themselves if a direct financial interest existed, is very clear. Instead, this decision uh, ignored previous cases um, where contributions were of 25 percent or more um, and created an entirely new te legal tests which exists nowhere in statute uh, which I think would have a very chilling effect on anyone who wants to make a contribution to local elected officials an American right to support candidates that they uh, support and believe in and have the uh, right to see those candidates elected, people they support, and carry out the policies that they advocated in their campaigns. Secondly, in this particular case, um, to conclude that these campaign contributions had an effect on Commissioner Donnelly is ludicrous. Having known him for 10 years, um, he, he does not long, make his- Long 10 years. It, it seems like a lot longer. <laughs> But um, Commissioner Donnelly does not vote for business interests because they give him contributions. Business interests give Commissioner Donnelly contributions because he believes in supporting businesses when it is prudent and reasonable. Mm -hmm. And to assume that these donations had a, any impact on his decision is frankly insulting. Um, he is very consistent in supporting business. Uh, when it is reasonable and prudent. And although I disagreed with him on this decision, it was a judgment call. And um, I think he acted completely in character with what I have seen for him in, ten, in his ten years uh, here. And I think he is an honorable, decent public servant who this decision, frankly, I think is insulting and implies that those contributions influence his decision. And I find that to be completely ludicrous and ridiculous. That's not the basis of my decision. The basis of my decision is that this creates an untenable and impossible situation for individuals to support candidates a basic American right. 
that's all I have. Thank you. I appreciate the the kind words. So painful. sort of kind. No, it must have been hard for you. It was. You must have been laying awake at night, uh, deciding whether you wanted to do that or not. Um, I just want to make a couple of uh, comments as well. Um, I know that this this has nothing to absolutely nothing to do with the land use um, application that the board uh, had seen in the past. But I will reiterate the point that I made to uh, members of the press over the last weeks. Um, I was hardly the only one to, to make the determination that this use was compatible with the existing land uses around it. Not only did the, did the Board of County Commissioners make that determination by, by, by a split vote, but also the Johnstown Town Council made the same decision that the Thompson River Ranch subdivision was a compatible use next to the gravel pit. Um, that being said, um, I have a long history in this community. I've lived here over 25 years of uh, putting this community and its people first. I was the person who developed the funding strategy plan that resulted in the expansion of I-25. I'm very proud of that. Um, I, have, uh, I have never placed uh, politics or even my own personal ambitions ahead of what I felt was the right thing to do for the people of this community, of, these commu of, the, of Larimer County. Uh, I've never sought higher op political office. I've never try tried to um, uh, uh, expand uh, any kind of opportunities for myself beyond just doing the people's business here in the Board of County Commissioners and I'm very proud of that. Finally, I have always followed the campaign finance laws of this state as they have been adopted by the state legislature and so have every single person that has ever donated to my campaigns in any capacity. They have always followed the campaign finance laws of this state with regards to my campaigns. Um, that being said, I agree with Commissioner Johnson, actually. There's, a, there's wide reaching implications to this decision beyond just me. Maybe you hate me. Maybe you hate the idea of the Thompson River Ranch Stroh Quarry. There are implications to this decision beyond either of those things, and, they are, and they're significant. We're going to have to start, apparently, county commissioners, elected officials throughout Colorado, not just on the Board of County Commissioners, city council members, et cetera, are going to have to be weighed. Their, their votes are going to be weighed based on their campaign uh, contributions. And, and if this was 18 percent of my contributions, it's, it's, there are organizations operating in Fort Collins and Loveland that contribute significantly higher percentage as a percentage of, uh, of contributions to individual candidates. Are those candidates now going to be uh, forced to recuse prior to their to these votes on these issues? We don't know. And so I think that it's important to get um, actually uh, a, 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 a second decision on this issue to ensure this is really the way the state wants to go. This is really the direction that the state wants to go. Because I, I promise you there are, there are far-reaching implications far beyond just me with this decision. It will affect it will affect um, land use decisions coming before the Board of County, this Board of County Commissioners and other members of this board, not just me potentially, in the very near future. So I'm going to support this appeal as well. Uh, look for a motion. Commissioner Johnson. I made one. Oh, you made one. I'm sorry. All right. We have a motion. All those in favor of the motion signify with an aye. 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 All opposed to the motion signify with a nay. Is there any member who would like to uh, recuse themselves? Or abstain. Sir, abstain. Uh, I wish to abstain. Very good. All right. So that motion has passed 2-0 with and uh, with Commissioner Kafalis in abstention. Um, Linda, is there any further business to come before the Board of County Commissioners this morning? Not today, Commissioner. Very good. The Board will stand adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>